The Big Interview with Dan Rather, featuring REM's Michael Stipe and Mike Mills. My wife, Jean's a painter. She's mm -hmm. been a painter all her life. And she suggested to me that because of your background as an artist, that you may see the stage as a canvas. Anything to that? I think so, yeah. M music was the medium that pulled me out of this, the kind of morass of teen teenage uh, self-questioning and place me firmly in a community, as I said, CBGB, the punk rock scene of 1975, uh, Patti Smith in particular, the band Television, the Ramones, uh, the Talking Heads. This was a scene that I felt instantly as a, as a teenager growing up, questioning my sexuality, wondering how I fit in, recognizing, acknowledging at 13, 14, and now 15 years old, I'm an outsider. I'm not the same as all these other people, largely because of my sexuality, I think. but. I was also different, and I've always been a little different. My father was different, uh, so I got it honest, as we say in the South. But uh, I found somewhere that I felt comfortable expressing myself, and, and music, rather than painting. And please tell Jean, I'm a terrible painter. I'm, I found out in art school <laughs> that my, my abilities with paint are, are pretty nil. I can't even paint a wall. I mean, I'm really bad. I'm bad. It took me almost 30 years to recognized that I had a voice that was very distinct and that people could recognize instantly as me. Um, I knew that I could sing. I knew that I didn't have perfect pitch, but I could work my way around that. And I found, luckily, this group of people, these three guys, that, that allowed me the platform to be able to become someone who could mesmerize from a stage, who could actually write a song that I could be proud of. Do you think or not that your shyness came from the fact that your father was in the military and you moved around a lot. We all know it's tough for kids to move around like that. That might have been a component, but I, I, I think that it's something that, uh, there's a um, self-doubt and insecurity that I carry that I think is really important to the work that I've done as an artist, as a, as a singer-songwriter, because it keeps the ego kind of tamped down. That, that profound egomaniacal urge to get up and, and perform and, and have to make not a few people in your life happy, but millions of people uh, happy, uh, to provide them with something that moves them or that gets their attention, is balanced by uh, this profound insecurity. And I think you'll find that insecurity in most artists. You'll find that in painters, in actors, uh, in writers, uh, and in musicians. And to be able to balance that, those two, the ego and the, and the insecurity, or the profound self-doubt, uh, is something that I think helped keep me relatively grounded all these years. And Mike, have you had that, what he describes as profound self-doubt yourself, maybe express it in different ways? Or have you always sort of been a sweet daddy cool? <laughs> sweet daddy cool. Thank you. You have a new nickname. I do. My friend. No, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, I had it less then than I do now. Um, for some reason, I just, again, I was not, I didn't overthink things as a younger person, let's put it that way. So. Uh, I, I felt that what we were doing was the thing we were meant to do, and it was really good, and you know we were all contributing to it, and I felt pretty great about it. Uh, as, as time goes on, maybe some, some, actually, instead of being more reinforced by success, I might have been a little even more doubt, doubtful of myself by the success, uh, but you know, not enough to cause me to lose any sleep. Well, it's been said that the combination of your skill and Michael's passion has been the key to REM's success, particularly the early success, the initial success. Agree? Well, that's not entirely inaccurate in that both Bill and I had some musical training. We were able to take uh, uh, Michael and Peter's ideas and turn them into a musical actuality. Especially for Michael, he, he didn't really necessarily have the uh, terminology to express what he was trying to, to, to get across. And so I would, I would say, well, if you want me to make it orange, <laughs> this may be how we go about doing that. So, um, you know, so I, and, and there were certain uh, chord uh, maneuvers that I would show to Peter that he had not, because uh, Peter was self-taught, you know, he learned off playing off records, but he hadn't, uh, he hadn't learned that many at that point. So I had some ideas that, that, that maybe showed him certain pathways to to get where he wanted to go. So, uh, you know, I think we all help each other, though. It, it, I mean, certainly, I, the very first time we practiced, I, I remember it was freezing cold in the church. And we showed, Bill and I showed them some songs that we had from our previous band in Macon, Georgia. And uh, 
and I remember really liking what both Peter and Michael did to these songs that we had. Michael took them lyrically and, mel and melodically into some amazing places, and Peter's guitar playing was like no one's, el no one else's, because Peter didn't thrash; he arpeggiated, and so all that came out of his guitar was melody upon melody. So uh, both Bill and I were very impressed after that first day and said, you know, this, this could work. Catch the full episode with special guests, REM's Michael Stipe and Mike Mills, on an all-new The Big Interview with Dan Rather. Premieres Tuesday, November 28th at 9, 8 central, only on Access TV.